When my brother Noel went missing last year, the police were of little help. They told us not to worry, that it was far more difficult to disappear than it was made to look on TV or in the movies. Most people turn up on their own after a while and their families find out, or pretend to find out, that the missing person's life was a little less respectable than they claimed, a little bit darker and more mysterious. Some people live two lives and nobody knows it but them. I did my own research and found out this much was true. According to statistics, the chance of abduction by a stranger was less probable than being struck by lightning. You are much more likely to be kidnapped by someone you knew, and far more likely to still not be kidnapped at all. But, despite their vague assurances and unfound assumptions, Noel never did come back. The weeks and months went by and there was no word. It seemed like the police had given up or forgotten about him. Digging through his belongings, I tried desperately to find something that would give a clue to his whereabouts. His computer was the best bet, I figured, since it was where he spent the majority of his time. Noel had worked as a database specialist for a big company named Protean, and despite the fact that he explained what he did to me a number of times, I never could properly figure it out. If people asked, I told them he was a computer programmer, since that was at least something most people could understand. He was an expert at assembling and troubleshooting computers, since my dad had owned a PC repair business when we were kids and Noel had taken quickly to technology as a child. He was building machines for my dad's customers in his spare time when he was still in his teens. Later, he went to college for computer sciences and only became more proficient over the years. Lately, he'd been experimenting with app design in his spare time and had gotten pretty good at it. He had told me he was working on one app in particular that was extremely different from anything else on the market. I had hoped the other programmer he had been working with would know something, but I tracked him down and that resulted in a dead end as well. Upon meeting the guy, I found he was a peculiar, disheveled looking satanist who refused to make eye contact with me and offered no useful information. He told me Noel had been, quote, of great help in his project but said the rest was top secret. I went home defeated once again. Noel's old computer was set up on my desk, so I turned it on and sat down, resolved to do some more digging. I logged into his email. Luckily Google had saved all his passwords, so I didn't need to figure them out through impossible guesswork. Searching through his old emails, I had found a lot of junk mail. There was correspondence with work and family and a few with friends, but nothing that would give any clue as to where he might be. If anything, they painted the picture of someone living an ordinary life, making plans for the future with no indication of wanting to disappear. His phone had been left behind too, and I went through that as well, looking for anything strange that stood out. But there was nothing. I sat there at my desk with the mouse in my hand for days and then weeks looking for something, anything of use. I poured through his doc files and JPEG and MP4s and MP3s, PDFs and every other damn file you can imagine, examining everything, desperately searching for some hint, some clue. Everything turned out to be a dead end. Of course, I called the police frequently as well, but they were of no help and eventually went so far as to tell me to stop calling, saying they would update me if they found anything. I'd cursed at them furiously and hung up, and that had been the end of that. I went back on his computer one night to dig through some more file folders and noticed something that my eyes had scanned over in the past. An icon in the sea of icons that lived in the busy and disorganized desktop. It looked a bit like a purple onion with a slice cut out of it. I clicked on it. A dialog box with a loading bar appeared briefly. Then, a purple window opened up that looked like a web browser. I realized that was exactly what it was. Tor browser, it said at the top. I knew little about these things, but understood that this was an untraceable way to use the internet since it encrypted everything being done online. Thinking back, I remember Noel talking about using Tor. He said it was much safer and couldn't be traced. But why would he care about being traced? I thought at the time. 
Maybe there was a good reason after all. Suddenly, my cell phone chimed, and I went over to it quickly and looked at the message. It was a URL. Another text came through. This one was a typed message from someone. Enter the URL on Tor. Another ding. Another message. Tell no one about this. If you contact anybody, I'm gone. I'm your only chance at finding him. I looked at Noel's computer. That was when I noticed the little lenses at the top of his monitor that was the built-in webcam. The red light was on next to it, indicating it was live. Someone was watching me, and they could see what I was doing on the computer as well. I was sure of it. After typing in the URL exactly as instructed, the screen turned in for a login for a website of some kind. I received another text. Password is his favourite movie. You have two minutes. I didn't need two minutes for that at least, since I knew it was Fight Club, as it had been since the movie had been released. My hands were shaking as I typed the password into the box. I was beginning to feel very concerned, but also a bit hopeful at this sudden turn of events. A chat window opened up, and a message promptly appeared from someone named Shadowcat. You're his brother, I take it? I typed back a response quickly, afraid of losing whoever this was. It felt like they could disappear at any second, back into the ether, and I would never find them again. Yes, do you know where he is? Yes. I was a little confused as to why my name was appearing in the chat window as Mark, since that wasn't my name, and I had never entered any identifiers. Was that an alias that Noel used online, I wondered? Is he okay? I took a deep breath, waiting for the answer. More or less. What do you want? You'll find out soon. Another message came through, showing another URL. Keep chat open, create a new window, and go to the URL. Okay. I typed in the URL and found myself at another website. It was a bit like eBay, except instead of selling old records and jewellery, People were selling guns, explosives, drugs, and so on. What the hell is this? Never mind your questions for now. Do what I say, or he dies. Suddenly, an image appeared, replacing the chat window. It showed my brother, Noel, chained to a wall in a stress position. He was blindfolded and gagged, but I could hear his muffled screams for help. My hands were shaking nearly uncontrollably now, and I had to type and retype my reply several times before it made any sense. How do I know you'll give him back? Trust me or don't, the choice is yours. If you refuse, he dies. If you do what I say, I will give him back to you unharmed. It seemed there was no other option. I felt trapped and hopeless, depressed in the horrible situation I'd found myself in. If I called the police, he would see me do it on the webcam. If I said no, he'll kill Noel. You have 10 seconds to decide. A countdown began in chat. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, okay. Good, here is a shopping list. Get everything on it. A long list of items was included next, and my eyes widened further as I read through it. What the hell is all this for? What are you planning to do? The chat window closed suddenly. I was left alone in my living room, my heart beating fast and hard in my chest. Only the other website remained now, the one with the black market guns and explosives and everything else illegal that you could have delivered to your doorstep. I debated calling the police again, telling them these new developments, or even going to the police station. But what if the kidnapper found out? He obviously had ways to spy on me. Probably. You'll probably say I'm an idiot for what I did next, but I really wanted to get my brother back. So, I filled in the online shopping cart with the requested illicit items and entered my credit card information, cringing as I hit enter. I guessed I would have to cancel my credit card, since I didn't trust the vendors one bit, but at least that part was done. The package arrived in the mail surprisingly quickly. As soon as I'd brought it inside, I got another text message. It invited me to another chat on tour, 
where I was given a physical address. They said to meet them with a package, and they would give me back my brother. I was to tell no one where I was going. It was dark by the time I arrived at the old warehouse in the industrial section of town. The place was abandoned, and there was no lights to illuminate the parking lot as I pulled in. My trunk had some cargo in it that would surely get me a couple decades in prison, if not more. Terrified, I sat in my car, still gripping the steering wheel tightly with both hands despite the car being turned off. I had no idea what was going to happen next. My cell phone chimed and I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was a text message. Come inside through the east door. I did a bit of quick geography to determine which way I was facing and decided that was the door I was looking at right in front of me. Taking a deep breath, I got out of the car. I popped the trunk and grabbed the duffel bag I'd brought with the illicit items packed inside. The gravel crunched beneath my feet as I made my way across the parking lot. My hand shook as I reached out and grasped for the doorknob, turned it and went into the dark, cavernous space inside the warehouse. As difficult as it was to see outside, it was even darker in there. Taking a few more frightened steps forward, I found my eyes did not adjust to the darkness. The door clanged shut behind me and I jumped, feeling my heart skip a beat. Hello? My voice echoed back at me. Did you bring everything? I jumped, startled when I heard the voice. It was raspy and made the hair stand up on the back of my neck at the sound of it, like fingernails across a chalkboard. Y yes? Good, bring it this way. Terrified, I stepped forward into the pitch blackness, unsure if I would run into something. I moved slowly and deliberately, hoping not to hurt myself. He's got it for us. He has it all. Yes. Suddenly, I realized there was not just one voice speaking, but many. They were all around me, surrounding me in the darkness. I felt their movements in the air around me and heard sounds like the wind blowing through a thunderstorm. Poisons, acids, knives, explosions, boomed a voice from the corner. Guns and bullets, snake venom. I had them moving closer now, inching towards me. Their voices were in my ear as I backed away. Where is my brother? Show him to me or you get nothing. I was terrified, but determined to get Noel back, come hell or high water. Or maybe we'll keep you as well, little brother. Maybe someone will want you back badly enough to bring us more offerings, more dark treasures. I could feel them very close now. I could hear their breathing and feel their proximity to me, causing my skin to break out in goosebumps. My mind raced, desperate to think of what I could do to get out. These creatures, these demons, whatever they were, had no intention of letting me leave. I had a sudden brainstorm. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my cell phone. Quickly, I hit the button for the flashlight function. If there was anything these creatures would be affected by, I guessed by their choice of habitat, it would be light. These are demons born of darkness, my lizard brain whispered. They are not accustomed to anything but blackness. The white light cut through the darkness like a knife. I heard screams and saw a brief haze of smoke appear. Around the edges of the light, I caught glimpses of vague forms and humanoid shapes. They recoiled from the light, and I felt and heard them moving towards me from behind. Spinning, I cast the light just in time to see one of the demons nearly face to face with me. His form was massive like a bear, huge fangs, and long sharp talons raised in the air ready to slit my throat. His red flesh bubbled and burst open. He evaporated into a misty haze when the light hit him screaming in a deafening baritone. Realizing that the light had power to destroy them now, or at least send them back to hell where they came from, I spun around and around with the light, ready to incinerate them all. I saw some bat-like thing flying away, and hid in the girders and beams above. I saw something at the other end of the huge space, and I showed my light at that direction. It was Noel. He was shackled to the wall on the far side of the warehouse, he was gagged and blindfolded, unmoving. I saw dark shadows around him, moving quickly, and I realized it was more of the demons guarding him. 
Running over towards him, I heard the sounds of more of them chasing after me, racing like monkeys across the steel beams above, matching my speed. I blasted the demons with the bright light from my phone as I got closer to him. Their shadow skin began to sizzle and burst into flame, and they howled like banshees and moved away. There was no key for the chains holding him, but I was prepared. I grabbed the bolt cutters from my bag, and last second impulse buy from my trip to the warehouse store. Part of me was worried that the people I was dealing with would not let him free willingly. I had wanted any advantage I could get. The bolt cutters went through the chains with an effort, and the one holding his wrist snapped with a satisfying noise and his arm fell down limply to his side. Before I could think too much about what that meant, I spun around to the sudden sound of movement behind me. I screamed as the claws of something terrible raked across my back. The demon disappeared back into the shadows above us, leaping into the air like a bat, and I saw flapping wings as it went back up to the rafters. I pulled the blindfold and gag from Noel's face and saw he was barely conscious. It felt terrible to do, but I slapped him hard across the face to try and get him to wake up. He groaned and stirred, but didn't open his eyes. I felt a sudden pain in my neck suddenly, like knives there, and I spun around quickly again to try and catch it in the light. There was a hint of smoke as my flashlight caught the edge of it, but it was too fast and quickly disappeared again. I was suddenly feeling frantic and terrified for my life. They were becoming more bold. My hand stung after the next hard slap to Noel's face, but it accomplished what I needed. He woke up and spit blood from his mouth. Ow, what the hell? Noel, wake up. You need to hold this light, move it around, keep them away. It took him a few seconds to understand, but I thrust the phone into his hand anyway and began to work on the other chain holding his right wrist. His eyes were wide with fear and his gaze darted around the room as it continued working on the chains. The one holding his other wrist snapped with an effort, and I got down on the floor to work on the shackles attached to his ankles. He was moving the flashlight around frantically, but it seemed to be working. Warm blood trickled down my neck and my back from my injuries, and I felt it turn cold in my skin. How the hell did you wind up here? I asked once he was finally free from the chains. That damn programmer, he's some of those things from hell. What? How? Never mind, just let's get out of here. I took the flashlight back from him and used it as a weapon, shining it every direction and often just in time as I saw the demons scatter from the light like cockroaches each time I swung it around. Once we reached the door, I threw it open to reveal the parking lot and we ran from there as fast as we could back to the car. We had escaped, or so we thought. I wish I could say that everything is better now, that we fled from the demons in that warehouse and never saw them again. But those unnatural creatures knew no boundaries. They were not inclined to stay contained within the walls of their warehouse. And they were not pleased that we had escaped with their treasures, which I promptly dumped off at the police station, anonymously of course. Although I got my brother back, neither one of us will ever feel safe again. The lights in my home stand all hours of the day and night now. Nor is the same way. I sleep during the day and surround myself with lights at night, terrified until the sun comes up. What am I afraid of, you ask? A blackout, a blown fuse, a burnt out light bulb. And they happen more and more lately. Always, I see them in the shadows, waiting, watching, patient, for their chance for the darkness to fall.